posed by the National Academy of Science in 1977. Nobody does those studies. Nobody looks. But then in, 19, in 1990, the National Toxicology Program found a dose-related increase in osteosarcoma in male rats, but not in female rats. And it's unbelievable to me <laughs> that the people commentating on this on behalf of the US Public Health Service sort of dilute this fact. They say, oh, well, it only, only appeared in the males. It didn't appear in the females, as if this was evidence of there not being a problem, when in fact it was supporting the very fear expressed by the National Academy of Sciences. But then, like a rabbit out of a hat, Procter & Gamble do another study. Actually, they dust up an old study which didn't find this uh, comparison. What was that thing I read out at the beginning? Conflict of interest? Procter & Gamble have absolutely no conflict of interest in this whatsoever. An NCI review of cancer, the National Cancer Institute, reviewed the cancer statistics for the whole country in the light of this finding, and lo and behold, they find there's a greater increase in osteosarcomas in young men in fluoridated communities and non-fluoridated communities. No difference for women, but yes, in young men, there is the increase. And oops again, here comes another rabbit. Hoover, same guy that wrote this, goes back and does another analysis uh, on a, a small subset of the data and concludes, because it's not related to the, the duration of exposure, this is not um, meaningful. Then the next year, in 1992, Cohn from the New Jersey Department of Health finds a six-fold greater in incidence in osteosarcomas in young men in fluoridated communities compared to non-fluoridated communities. No difference with the young women. And there were a number of other studies between 91 and 95 of varying quality which did not find this relationship. And then the bombshell. It should have been a bombshell, but it went off like a squid. In 2001, Elise Basson, a dentist, successfully defended her PhD thesis at Harvard. What did she find? She found in a case control study that if young boys were exposed to fluoridated water in the sixth, seventh, or eighth years, they had a five to sevenfold increase in developing osteosarcoma by the age of 20, not for the young women, uh, compared to non-exposed boys. So, bombshell or squib? Squib, why? Because her thesis survivor, advisor, Professor Je Chester Douglas, who signed off on her PhD thesis, went to, first of all to England in 2002 and told the British Fluoridation Society that his work found no association between fluoridation and osteosarcoma. Didn't mention her thesis. Again, he wrote to the NRC, same thing. My work shows no association. This time he puts her thesis as a footnote, but doesn't explain that her thesis contradicts what he's telling the NRC. And then he does the same thing with his NIH funders. Who is Chester Douglas? Well, he's also a consultant for Colgate, and this conflict of interest has been reported in the Washington Post, Associated Press, and so on, and so on, and so on. So much so that it prompted the Environmental Working Group to have an investigation, an ethics investigation of Douglas for hiding this result. They made their request to the National Institute of Health. The National Institute of Health gave it to Harvard. Harvard then came back about 17 months later, exonerated Douglas of deliberately. Now, I don't know whether we're meant to believe that this doddering old fool didn't know about her thesis or forgot, but they exonerated him of deliberately concealing Bassin's findings. And nothing that we've been able to do, writing hundreds of letters to the prof Harvard president of Harvard, a Freedom of Information Act, letters from congressmen, letters from senators, we cannot get anything from Harvard explaining how they came up with this result. Again, political power. Harvard is able to say, screw you. Basson's study is published. This is after the NRC review. They didn't have the final published report. The same journal that carried her article, unbeknownst to her, also carried a letter from Douglas warning readers not to take the... Uh, Basson's thesis as a final result. I mean, can you imagine that being a graduate student, having your professor disowning your paper when it, when it finally gets published? <laughs> Douglas Hoover, uh, Hoover again, Whitford again, uh, promised a study, it was due in the summer of 2006, which will negate Basson, but their methodology looks extremely weak. Uh, their controls are other bone cancers. Their, their control for looking at osteosarcoma are other bone cancers. And they're looking at the levels of fluoride in bone, which only gives you a cumulative measure of exposure and not the sensitive 
thing that Masson did was to look at it as a function of when the child is exposed, and it is just this midterm, uh, mid childhood bone uh, growth, growth spurt that she's looking at. So it's sensitive to age. They're looking at the total level of bones of the people once they've been diagnosed, which doesn't give you that sensitive uh, reading. We are still waiting for this report. Political power versus science again. In November the 9th, the ADA puts out an egram to its members, to its members, not to the public, not to the press, recommending that parents not use fluoridated water to make up baby formula. It does not publicize this advice. And then, even more quietly, in January of 2007, the CDC quietly put some the same recommendation on its website, but it couches it in language which desi designed not to threaten the fluoridation program. Now, this brings me into a list of moments when fluoridation should have been halted. It should have been halted in the 1980s when several authors, Leverett, Cahoon, Diesendorf and others showed that tooth decay was coming down as fast in non-fluoridated communities as fluoridated ones. Uh, you've seen this graph before. Uh, it should have ended when the largest survey ever conducted in the United States showed little difference in tooth decay in the permanent teeth between non-fluoridated and fluoridated communities. This is Brunel and Carlos. Uh, the study was organized by the NIDR. They looked at the teeth of 39,000 children in 84 communities. The average difference in tooth decay in children aged 5 to 17 who had lived all their lives in fluoridated versus non-fluoridated communities was 0.6 of one tooth surface out of up to 128 tooth surfaces in a child's mouth. Less than one tooth surface is what this angst is all about. 2.8 DMFS in the fluoridated, 3.4 in the non-fluoridated. But look how they report it to the public, the people that only read the abstracts. Children who had always been exposed to community water fluoridation had mean DMF scores about 18% lower than those who had never lived in fluoridated communities. With some of them, they do a bit of hand waving, get that up to 25%. The results suggest that water fluoridation has played a dominant role in the decline in carries and must continue to be a major prevention methodology. It doesn't say, look, we are saving 0.6 of a tooth surface, and that's why it must continue. No, it's 18%. Well, that's strictly true. This difference, which is 0.6 here, if you put 0.6 over 3.39, it is, in fact, 18%. But you can get really misleading uh, numbers if you look at the difference between two small numbers, and that's what we're looking at here. So it's the vagaries of arithmetic uh, that gives you 18%. Even that is lower than the 60-40% that they sometimes claim. Uh, this, incidentally, is Pollock's um, review of that literature, and he shows, well, it's only 0.6, but look at the trend. We can get it up to 1.6 of a tooth surface. 1.6 of a tooth surface. Five tooth surfaces to a tooth. Australia. Australia looking at two states, Western Australia and uh, Queensland, found a, a difference of only 0.1 to 0.3 of a permanent tooth surface. 0.1 to 0.3. And again, Spencer uses this as indication that fluoridation is effective. In New Zealand, DeLifter, looking at the whole of the New Zealand database, said the difference was clinically meaningless. Uh, David Locker for Ontario says the magnitude of fluoridation effect is not large in absolute terms, is often not statistically significant, and may not be of clinical significance. Australia, the effect of consumption of non-public water on permanent carriers experience was not significant. And yet, these same authors recommend fluoridating bottled water because of this result. I mean, it's bizarre. And this is, the, this is, you haven't seen this, this is the data from New York State where they looked at tooth decay in third graders by county in New York State. And this has been plotted as against the percentage of each county's, how, much, how many people in the county are drinking fluoridated water from naught to 100%. So naught to 100% of fluoridation and tooth decay in third graders, whoops, goes slightly up. There is, there is no relationship. 
between how much of the people in a particular county, New York State, and tooth decay in third graders. In fact, but if you look at it in terms of income levels, there's a very, very strong relationship between tooth decay and income, inverse relationship. The lower the income, the more tooth decay. And that is the complicating factor if that's not taken into account. All these studies are meaningless if you don't have an extremely tight control over income levels. Okay, third moment when fluoridation should have stopped. It should have stopped when the NTP animal study showed caused, uh, fluoride caused cancer in animals. I, I haven't got time to go into the fact that it wasn't just osteosarcoma, but there were other cancers that were appeared in that study, but they were all thrown out, and that got William Marcus fired from the EPA when he pointed out these shenanigans. But at that point, when you got a suspected carcinogen, the MCLG should have been set at zero because the EPA, the EPA has no safe level for a carcinogen. So once you've got a suspicion of carcinogen, that should have been the end of water fluoridation. But again, political power, manipulation, uh, kept that result to a minimum. In 97, when Heller and others showed that 30% of children in Florida communities had dental fluorosis on at least two teeth, and over 20% in non-fluoridated communities. Conclusion, kids are being overexposed to fluoride even without fluoridation. Here's his data. Here's the data for the flu children in fluoridated communities. Nearly 30%, 29.9%. Remember the trade-off in 1945 or 1950, was that we would get 10% of the children in this category, and we've got 30% uh, and with 5.8% of them in the mild category. This is less than 50% of, of teeth uh, impacted by dental fluorosis. We've got 5.8% of children in this uh, condition, and 1.3% of children with moderate dental fluorosis were uh, up to 100% of the, the tooth surface is impacted. Moments when fluoridation should be. In 1999 and 2001, when the CDC conceded that the major benefits of fluoride are topical, not systemic. They, it works topically. Topically. Fluoride's predominant effects is post-eruptive and topical. Its actions primarily are topical for both adults and children. It makes as much sense to swallow fluoride uh, to correct tooth decay as it does to swallow sunblock. Right? So it's, it's a, if it's a topical thing, you apply it to... This is what our crazy, crazy right-wing extremist nincompoop who won the Nobel Prize in 2000 said, in pharmacology, if the effect is local, topical, it's awkward to use it in any other way than as a local treatment. I mean, this is obvious. You have the teeth there. They're available for you. Why drink the stuff? Absolutely. Why did fluoridation continue after the CDC conceded that point in 99? In 2001, when Elise Bass's pup discovered her, uh, the connection with osteosarcoma, in two, not 2006, when the NRC said you've got to lower the four parts per million standard. In May of 2006, when Bassin published her study, another opportunity to end this nonsense. And in 9, when the, CD, when the ADA said, don't use fluoridated bottled water to, to make up baby formula. Now think about it. How on earth are you going to first educate the parents who have babies and who want to use formula? How are you going to educate them, number one? And number two, how are you going to supply them with an alternative water supply, with bottled water or what have you? I mean, once you see this, you realize that fluoridation has got to stop. And of course, the CDC uh, have done it, their best to wriggle out of this. So why does fluoridation continue? Two U.S. health agencies which could call a halt to this practice are compromised. The FDA has never regulated fluoride as a drug for ingestion and washed its hands of responsibility for the most prescribed medicine in American history. Washing their hands. And CDC has a conflict of interest. Key point. The Oral Health Division, I keep saying the CDC, but we should remind ourselves that when we hear the CDC in this context, we're really only hearing from the Oral Health Division. It's about 13 people, nearly all of them have dental degrees. There's only one PhD amongst them. There's nobody there in expertise in toxicology, epidemiology, or in other, other medicine. And yet we're allowing them to have this conflict of interest are promoting fluoridation aggressively on the one hand, 
to the point of in-person supporting mandatory fluoridation in several states and saying whether or not health studies are relevant. You, what you need um, is another section of the CDC that do have this expertise to be a counterbalance to these crazy uh, zealots, these pro-fluoridation zealots here, have to be counterbalanced in the public interest by people that have no interest in promoting fluoridation, but have a great deal of interest in public, uh, protecting the American health. But that is not operating at the moment. I requested Julie Gerberding to do precisely this. No response. It takes a long time to reverse a, a strongly held paradigm. It's difficult to get the higher levels of any bureaucracy to admit they've been wrong for so many years. And as far as the lower level bureaucrats, don't expect them to move unless these guys do if you want any career uh, at the end of the day. It serves the economic interests of several powerful industries, the phosphate fertilizer industry, whose crap it is we put in the water, fluoride using and generating industries, going back to the Bryson thesis, uh, the sugar industry, going back to that infamous statement from 1949, uh, the dental research industry. This is the gravy train for dental researchers. As long as you say at the end of your study, fluoridation is terrific, 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 you're going to get all the money you want to study teeth to the end, end of life. Uh, and note that the NIDR was actually formed on the backs of the fluoridation program. And Trenley Dean, who discovered this cozy relationship between fluoride and tooth decay, etc. He is the one that became the first director of the National Institute of Dental Research. So this is a huge gravy train for dental uh, research industry. The manufacture of dental products containing fluoride have an interest in this. The pharmaceutical industry, I may be out on a limb here, but the pharmaceutical industry does not make money when people are well, but when they are sick. And some of the best-selling drugs are being used to treat diseases that may be related to fluoride. Think of arthritis. Think of painkillers. Think of lowered thyroid function. Synthroid is one of the most prescribed medications in the United States. Think of behavioral problems in, with children, Ritalin and so on. Because U.S. regulatory agencies do not apply the precautionary principle. When exposing a whole population to a toxic substance, you cannot afford to wait until absolutely irrefutable scientific evidence has proved likely harm. If you did, uh, it would be too late for millions of people. If in doubt, keep it out. If in doubt, take it out. That's the precautionary principle. Now, applying the precautionary principle, these are my criteria, there are others. My five criteria of when this should be kicked, when this should kick into action is one, is there published evidence of harm? Yes, in spades. Uh, is the harm plausible from a biological perspective? Absolutely. How serious is the endpoint if it is real? Incredibly serious, life-threatening, life-debilitating. Uh, how important is the benefit being pursued? At best, 0.6 of one tooth surface. I would hardly say that that was uh, incredibly important. Uh, are there alternative ways of achieving the benefit? Absolutely yes, and most countries are pursuing that successfully. 98% of Europe is not fluoridated, and they're not uh, experiencing the terrible calamities that we were told, have been told for 60 years, would ensue if we didn't fluoridate our water. So on every single front, the precautionary pr principle should trigger. So why does fluoridation continue? No scientific body is powerful enough to force, the scientific, to, to force scientific accountability from the CDC and ADA. We can't get these proponents to go in front of a panel and be cross-examined on the evidence which allows them to continue stating that it's safe and effective, safe and effective, safe and effective. There is no accountability here. Ending fluoridation means ending the arrogance of power of the CDC and the ADA. And thanks to you folks, thanks to the IAOMT, you are making inroads into this unwarranted uh, power of the ADA. And good luck to you, and I hope you grow. Um, we need the power of the US Congress to force their experts, experts from the CDC, experts from the ADA, the experts they rely on to keep pumping out their misinformation, to testify and be cross-examined under oath. That is the key. And getting U.S. Congress to do this is going to be tough. I know it's going to be tough. We're trying. It's tough, tough, tough. 
is going to take in enormous efforts from the grassroots, from honest professionals in the medical, dental, and public health fields. And again, that's where you folks come into this picture in a, in a very big way. And at the end, I'm going to ask your help in this respect. And it is also going to require more journalists to do a professional job covering this issue. Any journalist that puts that CDC statement that fluoridation is one of the top 10 public health achievements of the 20th century and doesn't qualify it, is announcing to the world that they're not a professional journalist, that all they are is a, is a, a, a conduit for propaganda. They're not doing their job. And we need them to do their job. Meanwhile, over the last few years, these efforts have been greatly aided by the internet, email networks, and the ability to access and share key video material via Google. This is absolutely critical. They can no longer hide the scientific information. They can no longer make it difficult for us to communicate with people all over the world that con are concerned about this. And although our numbers are relatively small in the grand uh, scheme of things, then the amount of, of commitment, the amount of time, the amount of expertise, the amount of experience that our networks have is paying huge dividends. And one last word about, this is a recent uh, uh, revelation for me. We made this videotape with Bryson, and we were very happy with it, and uh, we started to distribute it. And I think we distributed about 200 copies. Then unbeknownst to us, somebody put this on Google. We didn't, somebody else did. And within a couple of months, 22,000 people have now watched this. And we're adding on about 100 a day. So this is a, a really splendid evolution from even the power of internet. So if you want more information about this, the Florida Action Network that my son, one of the joys of my life is that my 29-year-old son, who was only about eight years of age when I first became an environmental activist 23 years ago, is now uh, an, one of the world's best activists on this, this issue. He's the one that does this web page. Uh, what we're looking for, what we're looking for, we're looking for medical, dental, and other professionals uh, who are publicly opposed to fluoridation, prepared to go out and say, I am opposed to water fluoridation. And if you're one of those people, we need you desperately. We need to offset the new Bruns of this world who continue to tell, and unfortunately people continue to believe that the only people that are opposed to fluoridation are a little nutty and have no credentials. We need your name, please your name, your degree, your title or speciality, whatever you want to put in here, we'll decide whether to use it or not. If you've written any books, fine. Town and state. Uh, we want literally thousands of, of these. We just don't want anybody to say anymore that the only people who are opposed to fluoridation are those crazy, crazy vocal minority. So I don't know what time we've got left. I'll make it 9.30. Uh, do we have time for questions?